Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to show you how to easily determine if your molecule has any stereoisomers. So when it comes to stereoisomers, we are going to be talking about either N9 tumors, which are non-superimposable mirror images, or diastereomers, which are non-superimposable non-mirror images. But applying those definitions is all cool and easy if you already have molecules in front of you. But what are we going to do if I don't have a pair of molecules to compare? How do I even know if I have stereoisomers in the molecule to begin with? If I have a product of a reaction, or if I have just some sort of a random molecule in front of me, how do I determine if I have stereoisomers to begin with? With. Well, in this case, what is going to be more useful is instead of focusing on the definitions, rather we are going to focus on sources of stereochemistry, the molecular features that will be able to give us said stereoisomers. And the first source of stereochemistry that I am going to talk about is obviously going to be chiral atoms. And when we are talking about chiral atoms, is going to be atoms with four different groups, potentially it can be more different different groups, of course, but within the scope of organic chemistry, we are going to be looking at atoms with four different groups. And another important thing that I want to point out here is that I emphasize that those are atoms. Most of the time they are going to be carbons, but we could potentially have other atoms as well that are chiral. We can have chiral nitrogens, we can have chiral phosphorus or sulfur or even other atoms. So it doesn't have to be carbons. So for instance, if I look at this molecule, then in this case I do have a chiral atom right over here. And if I do have a chiral atom in this molecule, it does mean that I have stereoisomers. So I can represent my molecule as two different drawings. In one I'm going to put chlorine on the wedge and hydrogen on the dash, and in the other representation I'm going to put the hydrogen on the wedge and the chlorine on the dash. And as I explained in my tutorial on dashes and wedges, it doesn't matter how I tilt my dashes and wedges. I could have written my chlorine on the right and hydrogen on the left, or I could do it the other way around, and that would be exactly the same thing. So if you haven't seen that tutorial yet, go ahead and check it out to make sure that you understand what dashes and wedges mean and how to operate with those. Now, coming back to my stereoisomers here, in this particular case, the relationship between these two molecules is of course going to be enantiomers. These two molecules are non-superimposable mirror images of each other. Let's look at one more example. I have this molecule over here. And in this case, I do have another chiral atom as well. I have four different groups. I have this propyl group over here. I've got methyl group here. I've got ethyl group down there. And finally, we have our OH group. So four different groups on an atom mean that that atom is going to be chiral. And again, like in the previous case, since the atom is chiral, we are going to have stereoisomers. And in this case, I can draw these stereoisomers like so, for instance. And again, here we are going to have a couple of enantiomers. So whenever you have one chiral atom and your molecule, you are going to have uh, a pair of enantiomers. However, if you have two or more chiral atoms in your molecule, which is a very real possibility, we are going to have more stereoisomers. Um, we can potentially have up to two to the nth power stereoisomers, where n is your chiral atoms. That is the maximum number. Sometimes we're going to have less, because some of those molecules could potentially be meso compounds, and uh, you can potentially end up with less stereoisomers. But do keep in mind that if you have more chiral atoms, you are going to have more stereoisomers. Now, moving on to the next source of stereochemistry, that is going to be our double bonds. And if atoms of a double bond, which are typically going to be carbons, if those carbons have two different groups on each of the carbons, then it can also be a source of the stereochemistry. So for instance, let's look at this example. I have this molecule over here with with two different double bonds. Now, upon closer inspection, I can see that 
one double bond, the bottom double bond, has two of the same group. We have two hydrogens over here, which means that that is not a source of the stereochemistry. So we can ignore this double bond when we are looking for the stereoisomers, because we know that the carbons of the double bond must have two different groups. However, this double bond, well, that double bond has two different groups on each carbon. Carbon on the left has the ethyl group and the hydrogen, while carbon on the right has a hydrogen and the rest of the molecule. So each carbon has two different groups on it. And because of that, that is going to be a source of stereochemistry. In this particular case, this stereoisomer is going to be the E stereoisomer, and we can have an alternative to that, which is going to be the Z stereoisomer, where the stereochemistry of our double bond has changed, and now our hydrogens are sitting right over here on the same side of the molecule. And of course, any type of a relationship where you have E versus Z molecule, that is going to be diastereomers, because in this case, the two molecules are not superimposable in space and they're not mirror images, so that is quite literally the definition of the diastereomers. Now, here is another example that I have over here. In this case, I again have a double bond right over there, and that double bond is a source of stereochemistry. On the left side, we have this side of the molecule and this side of the molecule, which are not the same, and on the right side, we have this group with the OH, and we also have an implicit hydrogen all over there, so those are also two different groups. And as I have already indicated here on the screen, this is going to be the E isomer, and if I wanted to draw the Z isomer, that's how it's going to look like, and just like in the previous case, these two are going to be diastereomers of each other. And the final source of the stereochemistry that we are typically going to see in our molecules is going to be cycles, and most commonly those are going to be diastereomers substituted cycles. Now, one thing that I want to point out here is that those cycles do not have to be chiral. If I have some sort of a cyclic molecule and I have two groups, let's say some sort of X and Y connected to that cycle, and we have uh, this connection going symmetrically through the molecule, so we have a plane of symmetry cutting the molecule in half, well, in that case, the molecule is not going to be chiral. So in this case, we are not going to have chiral atoms, however, we can look at the cycle itself as a source of stereochemistry. Let me explain with an example what I mean here. So let's look at this molecule over here. I have a cyclic molecule and I have two atoms with substituents, but neither of those atoms are chiral because I do have a plane of symmetry going right through the middle of my molecule. So the left side of the molecule and the right side of the molecule are absolutely identical, which means that those carbons are not chiral carbon. You cannot have a plane of symmetry going through the atom that automatically going to make it a non-chiral or achiral atom. However, in this case, we can look at the ring itself as a source of the stereochemistry, kind of similar to a double bond. And in this case, we are going to be using cis or trans stereodescriptors instead of E or Z, because E or Z are only referring to a double bond. And here, I can draw two versions of this molecule. In one case, my two groups, my methyl group over here and my isopropyl group over there, are going to be on the opposite sides of the molecule. And in the other case, they are going to be on the same side of the molecule. So if my groups are on the opposite sides of the molecule, that is going to be a trans molecule, and if my groups are on the same side of the molecule, that is going to be a cis molecule or cis isomer. Or here is another example again. In this case, I do not have any chiral atoms because the molecule does have a plane of symmetry going right through the middle of the molecule, and I have a ring, which is a disubstituted ring, so I'm going to be looking at the ring itself as a source of the stereochemistry. And in this case, again, I can make a trans molecule and I can make a cis molecule. And similar to what we have in alkenes, whenever we are looking at the isomerism in cyclic molecules when we are using cis and trans stereodescriptors, in this case, these molecules are also going to be diastereomeric to each other because they're 
neither mirror images nor they're superimposable in space. So when you're looking for the different sources of the stereochemistry in your molecule and trying to decide if you're going to have stereoisomers for the molecule, first look for any chiral atoms. And as I've mentioned before, a chiral atom is going to be an atom with four different groups and we can potentially have multiple chiral atoms in the molecule. Look for the double bonds, each of which must have two different groups on uh, each carbon of the double bond. And look for disubstituted cycles that are going to be symmetrically substituted. So they're not going to be chiral, but yet they're still going to give you the cis trans isomers. And of course, each molecule can have multiple elements of the stereochemistry. So you can have molecule with a, uh, let's say, a double bond with a couple of chiral carbons, or maybe you are going to have a cycle plus some chiral carbons on top of that, or whatever might be the case. But these are the three most common common uh, sources of the stereochemistry that you are going to see within the scope of your course. And of course, this list is not exhaustive, but as I've mentioned, these are the most common ones that you're most likely going to see in your homework and on the exams. So as you can see, it's really easy to identify whether your molecule has stereoisomers or not for as long as you know what you're looking for. And you're going to be looking for chiral atoms, double bonds, and cycles. But if you want to learn more awesome chemistry, check out that video next and I will see you next time.